Um, hi, David. I'm glad to see you. It's always nice to see you. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing David uh, Duquette, who I've known for several years. He's been a mover and a shaker and a champion of this uh, industry. David Duquette is the uh, CEO of Littoro Power Systems. They develop and sell equipment for in-current hydrokinetics, head-based hydropower, fish, fish passage, and ocean plastic remediation. He's the principal investigator on at least four U, uh, U.S. Department of Energy Water Power Technology Offices awards totaling over $7 million. He is a sailor and, as I said before, a champion of uh, ocean energy and New England, what New England has to um, offer to that whole space. So, David, it's, uh, take it away, and um, I'm here if you need me. Thanks very much, Maggie. Thanks for all your hard work in assembling so many uh, brilliant minds in the, in the sector to uh, come here. Just a quick intro. Um, you know, an increasing number of marine renewable energy systems relating to wind and water are reaching the stage where working prototypes have to be demonstrated in operation in order to progress to the next stage. Silicon models and digital twins can only go so far. At some point, physical gear has to be assessed. Investors and early customers demand proven capability and reliability in order to provide capital or purchase equipment. One way to resolve this dilemma is through performance and reliability testing. Several cycles of testing and redesign can improve and de-risk equipment, which is key for commercial deployments. Today, we're gonna to look into five infrastructure initiatives for marine technology research, development, and validation. First up, we have John Miller. John, uh, beloved to all of us, is the director of the New England Marine Renewable Energy Collaborative. He runs the Bourne, test, the Bourne Tidal Test Site located in the Cape Cod Canal here in southeastern Massachusetts. Go ahead, John. Am I on? You're on. Can you hear me okay? Okay, yep. well, uh, thank you, David. Thank you, uh, Elise and Maggie, for this program. I, uh, I've been enjoying the, the uh, speakers and learning a lot from it. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am John Miller, Director of the Marine Renewable Energy Collaborative of New England. We're a nonprofit that works to uh, accelerate the development of marine renewable energy. I am gonna talk about the Bourne Tidal Test Site, but before I do, I wanted to say, if I can get my line to click, Am I set to, move, to uh, click this myself? Okay, I wanna say a little bit about um, the, the broader landscape of, of uh, tidal energy development and testing. Uh, this is a, a, a graphic that was done by NREL uh, to show how the cost uh, curve goes for a new product development. It's a little bit dated, but again, the emphasis here is showing that as you go from laboratory to development to demonstration, the costs go up. And for uh, systems in the ocean, they go up tremendously. Uh, we know that uh, between the uh, survival in the harsh ocean environment and the uh, cost of permitting, uh, getting over the top of that sill for, for, for tidal energy companies like Verdant and ORPC has been in a $100 million range. And the best way to help uh, new companies or new technologies to do that is to try to cut off the top of the hill by uh, providing pre-permitted test sites. When we talk about um, development, the Department of Energy uses technology readiness levels to describe the development. If you look at those, uh, the first couple are, are uh, university tanks at one level one through three. Uh, from there, you go to flumes, which basically are about, okay, uh, you go from uh, university tanks to flumes, which can support uh, tidal devices of about one meter in diameter, uh, because most of the flumes, the size of the flume is such that if you get larger than a meter, you get a lot of blocking from the walls of the flume. Uh, after flumes, you have to go to uh, what's called relevant uh, environments, which means getting to the open water. Um, and uh, when you do that, you're talking about, well, I, I should say first that the university tanks and flumes are the uh, areas that are covered today by the TEMER program, and you'll hear about that in a minute. Um, but as you get beyond that, 
you got to go to open water. And the established test sites, uh, people like the European Marine Energy Center or the um, uh, Canadian Force Program, were designed for full scale 10 meter uh, type devices. This jump from uh, one meter devices to 10 meter devices caused a lot of failures and a lot of lost money. And EMEC then moved to establish a nursery site to provide that mid-range testing. When we looked at this, we said that was what we thought was the need here as well, to provide that mid-range testing uh, for devices on the order of three meters. And that's what the Bourne test site is. Uh, now uh, the Water Technology Office is um, about to award a uh, project to do a full-scale capability, which called the uh, mobile test vessel. And that will really provide the US industry with the full range of test capabilities. So with anything more, let me move to talking about the Bourne Tidal test site. If I can get it to advance. Okay, this is the Bourne Tidal test site. Um, our test site uh, is a test stand. When we looked at, uh, we, we did some early testing of, of small tidal devices using barges, and we found that the um, instability of the barge uh, for both the turbine and the uh, sensors uh, made it difficult to get uh, good information. Our inspiration uh, to do something different was the Test set up at the uh, at EMAC that's used by um, Open Hydro was used by Open Hydro. This not only provided a, a a rigid stand, but also the capability to raise and lower a turbine out of the water to uh, maintain it or to provide upgrades. Uh, this worked very well for Open Hydro at EMAC. So that's what we de designed here with a test stand and a, a central lifting arm that allows us to move the turbine up and down out of the water. Again, this was designed primarily for three meter turbines. Uh, the water there is about two meters per second and a seven meter depth. So you don't have to worry about any significant amount of blocking. It's designed- well, you got about another minute. You got about another minute here, okay. It's designed for small uh, partial scale to distributed generation and it's nursery really. We've talked about doing this for, for multiple months testing, uh, but in fact, the first uh, turbine to go on at Aegis is looking at a very short test where they're gonna go in every day and modify the angle of the uh, blades so that they can um, uh, uh, verify uh, the performance of their design models. Uh, it is broadband, we have stable platform. And as I say, it's accessible. Uh, Aegis is gonna be able to pull their turbine up and down every day. Uh, and it's also close to shore. And it is secure in being uh, within an area controlled by the US Army Corps of Engineers. The platform has also been used by uh, four different organizations to do sensor testing of new sensors. So we're getting a lot of use out of, out of it and we look forward to, uh, to uh, hosting uh, devices and, and uh, turbines in the future. That's it, thank you, David. Sounds great, John. Um, next up, we have Jason Bush, who's the executive director of the Pacific Ocean Energy Trust. He's working with the DOE Water Power Technologies Office on the testing expertise and access for marine energy research, the so-called TEMER program. Thank you, thank you, David. You saved me the time of having to tell everybody what the acronym stands for, but we're pretty proud of that acronym, I'll tell you. Um, so thank you so much uh, to Maggie for inviting me today. I, I will say that I've only been able to dial in periodically today, but I've been very impressed with the uh, panels I've heard, nuanced, sophisticated, I think, uh, uh, these voices bode well for the future of this sector. So thank you for putting in this together today. Um, so POET is uh, the Pacific Ocean Energy Trust and I'm trying to advance uh, my screen here. Let me, uh, can somebody advance it to the next slide, please? Please. There we go, back one. Just real quick, POET, Pacific Ocean Energy Trust. Uh, we're we're um, honored that uh, the Department of Energy selected POET to administer the TEMER program. Uh, we've got that award about a year ago, and we are now fully up and running, having just finished the first round of what we call an RFTS, Request for Technology or uh, Testing Services. Um, so next slide, please. I think most folks know POET and OWEB, we've been around for a while, so we'll pass the uh, skip over the formalities there. 
Um, so you'll, I'm not going to read all of this. You all can, can uh, obviously access these slides after the fact, and you can dig into the details. I'm just going to bounce across the top and give you a general idea of what we're up to with the team or program. Um, in general, you know, many of you are probably well familiar with the, the difficulty and uh, process and money and uh, uh, energy that it takes to uh, put together a, a traditional DOE FOA to apply for that, uh, to if you, if you win it, to uh, get through the contracting and then uh, actually execute on it. It's, it's laborious, it's generally intended to be that way because of the amount of money that's flowing for those FOAs warrant that level of engagement and, and, and legwork to, to win those awards and administer them. Um, in, the, in the case of Teamer, the idea was to do that FOA once, select the network administrator, poet in this case, uh, and then allow us with our technical board that consists of representatives of the Department of Energy, uh, national labs, and, and uh, some, some universities that represent the NIMRECs in the, in, the, in the country, the National Marine Renewable Energy Centers, uh, to pull together the details of the TEMA program uh, and then execute on it. And so we did win that award last year. Uh, TEMA is a $16 million program at this point. <clears throat> the intent is to uh, support uh, as many projects as possible over that three-year period. Uh, we hope to uh, have 100 plus projects that are funded through the team of program over that period. Um, the general concept is that uh, we are seeking to provide funding for technology developers to go to facilities around the country that are pre-approved um, and to work with those facilities to put together a plan for how they're going, what they're going to do and accomplish their goals. Um, it, is, it isn't a competitive program. We're not comparing one technology or company against another. Uh, if you meet the standards of the program, you get, you get selected. Uh, no money passes to the technology companies themselves. It actually goes directly to the facilities uh, who work with that uh, technology developer to uh, execute on their test plan. Uh, currently, have, we have about 20 facilities that have been approved and we are adding to those all the time. Um, and uh, we're focused primarily on numerical modeling, bench testing, tank testing, and we do intend to do open water testing. There, we have not yet allowed that. It is a purely a function of the permitting reality of dealing with NEPA and an open water uh, deployment. It's, the time frames aren't working. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so thank you. Uh, we're open to all forms of marine renewable energy. We're taking an expansive view on that, includes obviously wave, tidal, OTAC, currents, uh, anything, even, even uh, you know, fresh water uh, systems as well, as long as it's not a uh, traditional or conventional hydropower uh, technology that uses a dam or some sort of diversionary structure. Um, and we are uh, clearly rep you know, reflecting the, uh, the focus on the powering the blue economy um, a program and, and markets. Uh, we're taking a, an expansive view of marine hydrokinetics if they relate to the marine, to the um, uh, blue economy. Uh, so we're open to those types of opportunities as well. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, so uh, this, this highlights the, the powering the blue economy aspect here. And um, I do want to emphasize that as a technology developer, what's essential is that you begin your process of engagement with a facility that you select to work with early in the process. And you'll work with that group to help identify their capabilities and availability to do your testing. And once you work with them for a while and get your, your ideas clear on what you want to accomplish, uh, they will submit what's called a letter of response directly to the network administrator, POET, um, making their recommendation on whether they think that you, that proposed plan is, is appropriate, uh, executable, uh, and, uh, and that they are you know, available in terms of people power and, and time, and especially right now with COVID, uh, whether they're, they're uh, uh, able to accommodate that. Um, next, next slide, please. So quick overview of the timeframes here. These are intended that the entire RFTS process last one year. So you have a 30 to 60 day open period to apply for the program. We had to take up to 60 days to select the program, the, the winners. Uh, you have 90 days uh, to, excuse me, 60 days to put together your uh, plan where you work directly with the facility uh, to, um, to articulate exactly what you're going to accomplish with your test plan. 
uh, you've got 90 days to test and then 60 days to report out on, on the results of that test. And then it repeats. Uh, we are already done with RFTS1 in the sense of having the first application period is closed. Uh, we've already selected the first winners. There were, I believe, 17 out of 26. I'm not entirely sure about those numbers, but approximately correct. Um, and they're now in the process of planning exactly uh, what their what their test plan is going to be with the respective facilities. Um, and then uh, moving forward, they'll be testing and reporting requirements. Uh, the second RFTS round is currently open. It will be open through December 18th. Uh, so that means that you know, RFTS1 and RFTS are overlapping and that's the nature of it. We're going to move this as quickly as possible. And we are looking to a future where there'll simply be an open enrollment uh, once we get this system down. Why don't we get a little bit into this in the Q&A? We kind of got to wrap this up and keep, keep going. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. So okay. just last word on facilities, yep. though. Um, for those of you who run facilities, this is an important part of the program. Go to the team or website. You'll find a link there that tells you how to get your facility approved. And once you're approved, you can be part of the RF, the, uh, the team or program. Terrific, Jason. Thank you very much. Next up is Martin Wozniak. Martin is an associate professor at the University of New Hampshire and the director of the UNH Center for Ocean Renewable Energy. He oversees several test systems that are regarded as a gold standard in our region. Well, thank you, David. And uh, uh, thank you, uh, Elise and Maggie, for organizing this. Um, uh, on the opening slide, these are all uh, devices we've deployed at uh, uh, tidal sites uh, and, uh, and, and our offshore site over the last uh, few years. Here's an overview of our infrastructure. Going from the top left, you have uh, our campus with uh, our ocean engineering, engineering laboratory, uh, then two tidal energy test sites, uh, both at bridges. Uh, our first one was the one at General Sullivan Bridge, uh, and the second one is right in downtown Portsmouth at Memorial Bridge under the Living Bridge Project. Uh, the university owns and operates a pier uh, here on Newcastle Island, and we have an offshore test site about a mile and a half south of the Isles of Shoals, about uh, six miles offshore. There are a couple of other uh, uh, marine labs here, uh, Jackson Estrian Lab and, and Shoals Marine Laboratory on, on Appledore Island, which fulfilled certain roles as well. Can I advance the slide? Oh, yeah, good. So here's uh, just a couple of uh, uh, pictures of, of the lab, uh, our engineering tank, our uh, tone wave tank, both are part of the TEMA program with a couple of TEMA products coming in. Uh, our lab is a state-of-the-art uh, uh, test facility for anything uh, related to ocean engineering or ocean renewable energy. We also have a new uh, oscillating flows water tunnel where we can uh, create currents and waves and a small cavitation tunnel. And uh, my colleagues and I uh, engage in, in a broad range of ocean related uh, research subjects. Oh, here we go. Uh, the uh, UNH Pier, uh, and, uh, the, which is part of the uh, Judd Gregg Marine Research Complex is shown here. We have about a hundred meter long pier with the number of research vessels at the st staging point with docks, cranes, power, internet. Uh, you can see another overhead view here looking out on the pier and here you see the frontal view. Uh, the NOAA vessel Ferdinand Hassler is home ported here as well. And, and you see the, the devices we've worked with on the, on the uh, uh, pier here, a couple of examples of a wave device and, and a, a tidal turbine. This is a 3.2 meter diameter cross flow turbine, so just for scale. The tidal energy test site at Janelle and Sullivan Bridge. Sullivan Bridge is shown here. You can see some of our very early deployments about 10, 11 years ago. Uh, and then it got, got a bit more sophisticated over time. Uh, it's a nursery site. Uh, deployments uh, from a platform turbines up to three meters diameter. Peak currents uh, exceed 2.5 meters per second. The nominal depth is about 10 meters. Uh, you can see a 36 minute uh, uh, ADCP, ADCP survey average here. Uh, and you can see the location of the test site. Everything in red is above uh, above two and a half meters per second. Um, the other test site, uh, which we've been uh, working at for the last several years, is the uh, Memorial Bridge site, which was part of the NSF funded Living Bridge project. We have uh, this drawbridge fully instrumented. Uh, we're providing power uh, by 
a tidal turbine to an array of sensors, both on the bridge and, and uh, in the estuary. For scale, it's shown here where this project sits. Uh, it's it's uh, moored to the Portsmouth facing side of uh, pier number two. Uh, we have a 22 foot tall vertical guide post that this whole platform rides up and down on. This is a uh, about a 50 foot by 20 foot platform, 16 by uh, 15 by six meters. It's it's very very stable, uh, and we've had this deployed since June 2018, and uh, uh, it's been very reliable. You see uh, again a 3.2 meter diameter cross flow turbine operating here, and the tides are a bit asymmetric at this location, but we are right in the sweet spot on the on the ebb tide, as you can see from this. Uh, the survey here again it's it's also about 300 meters across uh, and uh, this side is quite a bit deeper we're at about 18 meters depth here uh, at the, the location oh yeah I should also say for the site that this site is actually grid connected uh, with very easy access you can see the grid connection to the bridge grid right up here and we are working with our partners National Renewable Energy Laboratory and the European Marine Energy Center uh, and have developed a roadmap for uh, accreditation to test under I, uh, ISO IEC 1725 uh, according to the IEC TC 114 specifications at the site. And I think George Bonner in the next presentation will say something similar about their wave test site. Uh, our offshore test site, uh, six miles offshore, one point uh, five miles south of the Isles of Shoals in 52 meters of water in state waters. Uh, and uh, we've developed a number of systems out here. It started with aquaculture about 20 years ago. And for the last 10 years, we've been deploying uh, wave uh, energy converters out here. Uh, this is typically um, uh, coupled with UNH uh, uh, based mooring system modeling. And uh, the site translates pretty well to 1 20th scale models in our, in our wave tank. And this is uh, all I have. Here's uh, shown of some of our sponsors. And I would like to finish by saying that uh, we're well equipped to uh, support marine renewable energy, uh, utility scale development up to uh, technology readiness level uh, TRL6, and uh, to support any powering the blue economy uh, development uh, up through TRL8. Uh, thank you. Terrific, Martin. Thank you very much. Next up, we have George Bonner. George is the director of the North Carolina Renewable Ocean Energy Program. He's going to tell us about his involvement in DOE's Wave to Water competition, which will be hosted in Nags Head, North Carolina in spring 2021. All right. Thanks, David. Um, so um, I'm relatively new to this job, came into it last year. And before that, I spent the first 30 years of my career as an engineer in the Coast Guard. So uh, working on a lot of infrastructure and systems to protect the mariner and our commerce from the destructive or, you know, forces of our, of our, of our seas. And uh, so it's refreshing now to be, you know, working on uh, those same forces and trying to put them towards renewable energy solutions. And so I've really enjoyed the job. And um, let me see if I can advance the slide here. Do I have controls of the slides? There we go. There we go. So a little bit about our program. Um, the North Carolina Renewable Ocean Energy Program has been around about 10 years. Um, so it's a state-funded program that supports interdisciplinary uh, research across our UNC system uh, focused on marine hydrokinetics. Um, and uh, I'm based at the Coastal Studies Institute, which is on the Outer Banks, uh, the building you see behind me. And uh, we work closely with NC State University Engineering UNC Charlotte uh, Engineering and North Carolina A&T uh, are the primary partners, but we also work across all the UNC um, institutions um, there. Let's see, let's see here. All right, just a little bit about our mission and our vision of our program. Um, like I said, we support about 15 to 20 interdisciplinary projects each year. Um, a lot of those projects are fo focused on the resource assessment side. Um, and you can see in the middle there, that's the Gulf Stream, which is off the coast of North Carolina, uh, trying to understand how we can tap into the Gulf Stream, 
as well as our wave energy resources and also focused on the environmental side and understanding the environmental assessments and how we can mitigate any impacts from marine hydrokinetics. Um, on the left is some magnetic transmission technologies developed that uh, can minimize the operation and maintenance costs in the harsh uh, marine environment. And then on the right, an example of a, of a uh, harvesting system uh, using kite um, har harvesting technologies for currents. Um, and it's currently being funded by DARPA for uh, unmanned underwater vehicles. And I like, like it's been mentioned on a lot of the other presentations today, we have offshore wind being developed off North Carolina, the Kitty Hawk lease and the Virginia lease uh, just to the north of us. So we're also very focused on how we can complement offshore wind uh, with marine hydrokinetics. I just want to mention uh, our, we have a really good program uh, with the mechanical engineers at North Carolina A&T University. Uh, they competed in the Marine Energy Collegiate Competition last year. Uh, they were awarded with the Rising Star Award, and you can see them in the bottom right there. That's They're testing uh, their wave energy device at the uh, our CSI uh, wave tank uh, last spring. So just kind of the focus of our program and uh, the one I want to talk about mainly is, you know, we had done, this is an update to our strategic plan last year, and we really want to focus on open water testing. We think that's important uh, to get devices in the water in a real open water environment. And uh, so we can understand environmental impacts and, um, so that's been a focus area of our program um, over the last couple of years. And we do that at our uh, ocean research uh, platform at Jeanette's Pier. It's real close to our, the campus at Coastal Studies Institute in Nags Head. It's a state owned pier. So we have a partnership with the North Carolina Aquariums um, and we've tested several devices. We're, we're permitted um, there. And, um, and we also work with the Army Corps of Engineers at the field research facility which is just, just north of us um, in Duck, North Carolina. And uh, as mentioned, we were recently selected to host uh, the Department of Energy Waves to Water Competition, which is um, wave power desalination devices. And uh, we're also working with the Corps of Engineers to support that to make sure to best understand the wave field uh, during the competition. And uh, this just shows the different stages of the wave, waves to water competition. Um, you can see in the bottom left where the, during the drink phase, which is where the devices are actually put in the water, they're tested for five days. Um, and that's where the devices will go. Um, we, uh, we're currently in the adapt phase. Uh, so the winners of that will be announced uh, sometime this winter. And then um, teams will be funded during the create phase to actually create the devices. And then we're gonna um, actually, the drink phase will be in the spring of 2022. It was originally gonna be in 21 and because of COVID, everything was kind of moved out a year. So uh, we're gonna be in the, in the drink phase. Uh, we're excited. Uh, Jeanette's Pier gets about 250,000 visitors a year. Um, so we're excited about the opportunities to showcase um, these technologies to, you know, the, uh, K through 12 and all the visitors, we're gonna live stream this. So they'll be, uh, be able to showcase uh, what's going on with the competition. Uh, we're, we're also gonna have some workshops and uh, bring in college students during, during the competition. Um, some challenges like, like uh, uh, was mentioned earlier by Jason, you know, it's a federally funded uh, competition. So we're going through the NEPA documentation and uh, we're working closely with NREL on our biological assessment now and uh, that that's moving smoothly and also working on uh, anchoring systems and how we're gonna manage that. We wanna, obviously safety is very important during this competition. And uh, we wanna make sure also that, you know, we're uh, meeting all the requirements of our permit. We're not having any uh, negative environmental impacts. And then we wanna be fair to all the teams. So uh, working on uh, the rules for anchoring systems and, uh, and how we're gonna do envir environmental monitoring during the competition as well. Um, and then as, uh, Martin mentioned uh, kind of our long-term plan for our testing platform. We have a, a really cool uh, green energy hub, uh, micro grid solution developed at NC State's Freedom Center. And uh, we wanna get that installed at Jeanette's Pier um, so we can do longer term demonstration projects at uh, Jeanette's Pier. We do have um, uh, wind turbines on the pier. So how can we integrate um, marine hydrokinetics with the wind turbine uh, energy produced at the pier? Uh, so we're excited about that. And I uh, think we're, we're kind of, yeah, let's keep, are you pretty much done, George? 
I'm good. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Yep. Lastly, we're going to hear from Chris Sharman, who's a professor of mechanical engineering at UMass Amherst. He is the coordinator of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers Ocean Renewable Energy Symposium. He's working on flume testing of in-current hydrokinetic devices, but apparently he's got quite some interesting new toys, which uh, I'm anxious to hear about. David, thank you very much. And um, thanks also to UMass Dartmouth um, for this and John for making that connection. Um, so our, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, ocean resources and the renewable energy lab we are building at UMass. Um, in the past three years, I've been here at, uh, at UMass Amherst. Uh, we are trying to build a little ocean in the, in the western part of the state. Um, supplementing the wind energy program, which has been active and has, has a long history. Uh, we bring in the offshore and the wave and the tidal energy uh, components to strengthen the renewable energy program at the university. And you can see our group has steadily kind of been building up in the past uh, three years. And there is a lot of interest from uh, our undergraduate students, which I'm really, really proud of. So what we have been doing and uh, want to talk about is this wave current or a wave tidal flume. Um, uh, here we list the, the properties, the geometric properties. It's a, it's a laboratory scale facility, a little over 11 meters long and the operating water depth of one meter. Um, this is all uh, indigenously designed and put together. Um, starting from scratch. And uh, some of the unique aspects of this facility are that uh, we, we have kind of built it modular, so it can be operated as a wave tidal flume. It can be a standalone wave tank or a, a recirculating current flume. Um, so we have a, to create the tides, we have, the, we have a modular wave maker and a beach, so we can interchange uh, the wave maker so we can have waves opposing currents. And uh, we, have to, we have to have a special design to accommodate the wave maker and the, the nozzle that brings the, the current flow. So, that's, so that you can see a lot more here. You can see the recirculating flume, uh, which brings the water at a 45 degree angle under a plunging, plunger wave maker type, type system. And then we have, a, uh, we have a removable nozzle arrangement here, which can be put in if you want to have a more streamlined flow. So after a couple of years of dedicated effort, we managed to get the facility to this state here. So we have actually have completed the facility and um, we are planning to fill the tank anytime now and check for leaks. <laughs> um, so that's, that's where we are at the moment. And um, um, a lot of research went into this, um, the designing the facility in particular, bringing in the, the currents um, and the shape of the nozzle and how we bring in uh, what we do and what you see in the simulation, a lot of CFD work we have done to bring, see a lot more green here, which means it's a lot more uniform flow because we are very keen on looking at the non-uniformity in the cross section and the free stream turbulence in the flow. Um, eventually, we hope to also be able to bring in some kind of a profiler so we can create a profile current and uh, people like Martin, you know how difficult uh, getting a profile in a tank can be. So that is in the future. Um, I know, John, you talked about, and a couple others talked about uh, TRL levels um, and how small facilities like these have a unique place for early stage TRLs. But what is also very important and that fills the, the completes the picture is the TPL. The technology performance level is also very important. And this is a picture taken from a very interesting handbook on ocean energy. And what you see is TRL on the x-axis and TPL on the y-axis. Small facilities like these 
have a very important role to fill at, although at low TRLs, they can contribute a lot at higher end TPLs. And so the green line is actually the optimum path of travel for developing a technology. So we could have a lot of contribution from small facilities like these as we progress our industry further. And in particular, uh, the combined effects of waves and currents are still relatively uh, less understood. And in terms of TPL improvements in the MHK domain, you can think of currents affecting the wave energy device performance. And uh, perhaps more well known is the uh, fluctuating pressure loads that waves impose on tidal turbine systems. So both of these we think are uh, very good reasons to have facilities like these to support uh, our industry. Uh, what type of projects can we do? Here in our facility, wave current interaction, wave tide interaction. Uh, since we can rotate the wave maker, we can create waves opposing the current flows. Uh, we can look at uh, hydrofoils, uh, tidal turbines, of course. We can also do vortex-induced vibration work. And uh, for TPL improvement, we can do component testing uh, of various structures. Uh, and a simple example of that was in, uh, we did some experiments to support the design of uh, heave plates, which are used in principal powers uh, offshore, uh, floating offshore wind turbine platforms. And that's a key component of their, uh, of their system. And we were able to build small scale models and test them to ascertain their hydrodynamic properties. And another interesting thing is, can we do structural oscillations in a uniform current to see how currents can affect the hydrodynamics, hydrodynamic coefficients of various structures. A lot of stuff we would do also supports numerical uh, capabilities. We have uh, uh, groups interested in uh, CFD work, such as um, you know, open source, open foam, or uh, smooth particle hydrodynamics, which is what the simulation you see here. And also state-of-the-art industry software like OrcaFlex, SESAM, and FAST, which can support offshore wind, wind development and uh, things like that. Great. Oh, Chris. We think we have a lot done. But we'll get into a little, fast. Chris, let, let's get into a little more in the q and I just want to make yeah. sure that staying yeah. on schedule here. That's my last yeah. slide. But so, uh, go ahead, yeah, finish your last yeah. slide, go ahead. Our, um, we just, our future capabilities include uh, high-speed photography, some uh, uh, laser-based uh, uh, diagnostic techniques, and uh, rope testing. Thank you. Wait, that just slipped in at the end. What is rope testing? Rope testing is um, like um, um, any, any sort of ropes uh, you use in uh, the marine aquaculture oh. environment. It's the strength, strength of that in... Uh, in water testing. Okay. Well, a question for you guys. The you know Martin alluded to this, but I'd like to hear any of the panelists who have um, an opinion on it. What is important about accreditation? By whom? And are you pursuing it? Martin, you started to get into that, so maybe take the the lead on this. Um. Sure. So, uh, accredited testing is. Uh, testing that is certified under uh, general lab uh, testing standards, ISO standards, and then it's applied to marine uh, energy specific uh, standards. And it, uh, it, it, testing done under this under or under these standards gives uh, confidence that your device actually performs, the testing was done in a way that uh, experts agree on it should be done. And uh, it was done to to certain, uh, you know, instrumentation uh, standards, et cetera. So that gives people confidence that the data that comes out of this testing actually means something, and that would give investors confidence to to also move forward. And this uh, this should be applied fairly early on. Uh, we are about to publish, uh, or IEC is about to publish a uh, standard for scaled uh, tidal testing. That's the uh, dash two hundred two under TC one one four. Sorry for all the numbers and acronyms, but uh, you know, it hopefully means something to some people. 
And uh, that applies to both laboratory testing and, and also scaled uh, field testing. So, so up to maybe the, you know, two, three meter devices, four meter devices or so. And uh, uh, the, the curves that Chris showed are really interesting. Uh, you don't, uh, it, it basically tells you, you want to spend as much time as you, as you need to uh, uh, doing numerical work, doing lab work uh, before you go larger and go, go into open water. And uh, hopefully the accreditation will ensure that the slope of this curve is steep enough that you actually don't end up in the uh, in the region of death that was the uh, the, the gray shaded area. Yeah. Okay. Are any of you, you other guys pursuing accreditation? Are you you looking yeah. at that, Chris? Oh yeah. Sorry. Uh, no, we're just building the facility. So yeah. yes, but that would be interest in it, and uh, yeah, bringing yeah. some. John, you're very close to the commercial world in your work. Are you absolutely what, what Martin says is absolutely correct. Uh, to be able to test uh, devices and have them compared one to another, especially for funding agencies, it's critical that we have standards to make sure we're comparing apples to apples, not apples to oranges. Sure. George? Yeah, definitely. We uh we've talked to folks at EMEC and to Martin about a long-term strategy to go towards accreditation. And we think that's important, really important. Okay. We got a question for Jason here. Uh, to what extent have New England based testing facilities been listed as part of your team or program? Make sure I don't make a rookie mistake and have the mute button pushed. Um, <laughs> so we have been, I just pulled up, I saw that question. I pulled up a quick uh, spreadsheet that lists um, all the facilities we now have, you know, 50 some odd facilities, so bear with me. Um, so scrolling quickly, Lehigh University, um, Naval Surface Warfare Center, Carter Rock. I know UNH, obviously. Uh, still scrolling. Alden, Jason, isn't Alden now part of it? One more time. Isn't Alden now part of Teamer? Um, don't think so, at least not on the spreadsheet that my staff sent to me. And I'll be the first to admit that uh, my staff, uh, Matt Sanders uh, and Samantha Quinn are the are the real experts on team where they're, they're administering all of this so they could have uh, better answers. So feel free to reach out to us on that. Um, still scrolling here, uh, Stevens Institute, um, University of Iowa, um, obviously not Northeast, Michigan, uh, New Hampshire, um, So, uh, so they're, they're getting added. And again, uh, I think we started with about 20 in the first round and we've added another 25 or 30. So uh, the, the, the intent with this program is uh, Penn State here, by the way, still scrolling. Uh, the intent here is to build significantly on that core group of facilities that this industry has relied on from the national labs, obviously in the NIMREX, but we, we're well aware that there are capabilities around the country and we're very proactive uh, seeking uh, outreach to those groups. We're working with the Society for Underwater Technologies at Texas A&M University, for example. Uh, one of the, um, our contract with them is, uh, is to help, to have them help us identify these facilities in the Southeast, especially working with the oil and gas sector. Uh, so we know these capabilities are out there and we want to increase the university, the facilities that are able to work in this sector. We, we just got a reminder that OMSET in New Jersey is also uh, supposedly yeah. on the team. Absolutely, now. OMSET's on there. I, I guess just it's a, just the last question. You know, sometimes um, outside private industry doesn't have uh, all that much of an insight into some of the inner workings of some of your facilities. How does a test work? What kind of data can the client expect to receive when when it's over? Maybe John, you can you can start with that. What what kind of package would you like to present uh, to to testing clients? Uh, well, I mean, it's totally dependent upon what the what the customer, what the developer wants. Uh, the the standards, the ISO standards, uh, TC one one four, provide uh, a framework of what you should of how you should be doing it. But uh, different developers are looking for different things. As I said in my presentation. Uh, Aegis is working on a uh, SBIR, and what they want to do is use the, the test site to be able to modify the angle of attack on their uh, 
their blades continuously in a, in a continuous program so they can validate their modeling. So they're not necessarily looking for uh, actual performance curves exactly, but, but they want to be able to validate their models. So it's up to what the customer wants. I mean, uh, we're looking at most of our, the people we've talked to are looking for multiple uh, lunar cycles uh, in, the, in our test site because they want to look at reliability and want to look at fouling. Uh, so again, up to the customer. Right. And George, you tested you, you test a wide variety of devices down at the pier, correct? Um, so do, do you have any sort of... Uh, yeah, so most of the testing we've done is the client's looking to see how it performs in that open, you know, dynamic environment. And uh, so they're not connected. You know, we don't have a microgrid in yet. It's just seeing how it form, performs. Some of them have been bottom mounted. Some of them have been anchored. Um, you know, so just seeing how it performs in that live real, real environment. Good. All right. Well, thank you very much, guys. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, many people in the uh, in our community here will be delighted to be in touch with you guys about um, it, correctly administering test programs. That that's the the absolute key to commercializing uh, any of these types of devices, whatever the resource that's being prosecuted is. So fantastic. Thank you very much, Maggie and Elise, for your hard work setting this thing up. And uh, I think we're on time.